welcome to King's College Chapel. It's a rather sort of festival building, as you can see, full of gilt and, and bright colours. Um, and maybe that's quite appropriate because uh, your books are very vivid and they've had a huge um, and positive effect on my son, Adam, who's nine, and, and indirectly on me through reading them to him. Um, and one of the things that I would love to explore with you is the way in which your books um, might in some way be, perhaps in a subterranean way, be influenced by the Bible. Um, our project explores the way in which the Bible is a, a source of creative inspiration for visual artists, but we're also really interested in the way in which other creative artists are affected and, um, by it. And it might just be that you, there are bits you can't stand and that you've tried to, you know, <laughs> Philip Pullman's sort of corrected the Bible in all sorts of interesting ways in his novels. So I, I'd love to hear what sort of a role it might play in your work. Absolutely. I think, as you say, the subterranean quality of the Christian story, I think, has coloured so much children's literature. And, of course, so much of the ethics that children's literature stands by. Um, one of the ways I think about it is if you could tell children something and you could guarantee through some magic fairy that they would believe it. Not they would half believe it or a little believe it, but you could tell them something and they would take it to heart for the rest of their lives, like putting a sort of fish hook through the imagination. What would you tell them? And I think the things that I want to tell them are things that I cannot prove to be true but that I believe utterly to be true. And they are things like love will matter, hope will matter, your endurance and your tenacity will matter. Something along the lines that your generosity, your, your self-sacrificing boldness as you move through the world will matter. And I think those ideas are, of course, deeply bound up with a kind of certainly with the Christian ideal, if not with the lived experience of the ways that Christian and he has always played out. I love that, I, that idea of um, making a decision about something that is unprovable, and because repeatedly your characters have to decide in the face of unprovable things. Um, the Wolf Wilder uses the word probably a lot. In fact, very, very funnily, a lot of the time, Theo, the main character, says probably when not quite reassuring other people about the wolves and how safe they are. Um, but there's something sort of bigger about those probabilities, which is true of the dilemmas that nearly all of your characters face, that they can't be certain. And they have to learn to live with confidence in the face of those uncertainties. Um, so uh, for me, that, that's a sort of question of faith, actually. Is that me trying to crowbar a theological idea into something? No, I absolutely see that. I think... The thing I often wanted with the children in my books is the thing they're learning to put their faith in is love. Mm. And they are children who love recklessly and freely without, without reckoning, without a, a, an accounting of the balance sheet of love, mm. that they are all children who act for love. And the idea in all of the books, um, which I don't expect children to see, it's a kind of Trojan horse. Mm. I want to write books for children that will have in them, you know, plots, children uh, climbing trees and uh, going down rivers and climbing on rooftops mm. and riding wolves. But underneath it is the hope that they might see love will give you courage. Mm. Love will make you brave. Love will give you back so much if you offer it with a kind of boldness and exuberance and that's what they all have in common, this idea that I want to offer kids a sense that Frank Cottrell Boyce, a brilliant children's writer, who is also a very devout Catholic, he always says, what are we doing in children's fiction? We are giving them a blueprint for happiness. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I want to offer children is the idea that your love, your tough and funny and inventive and careful and imaginative love will be your guiding force for your life. Therefore, Love as boldly as you can, mm. because it will shape your heart and push you forward. Mm. This explains something about the reason I think that the words fierce are often used mm -hmm. about you and about your <laughs> writing. 
Um, and it's, it, it, but it is, it's a ferocity particularly of love um, and truth sometimes. Um, the need to tell truth, uh, often in relation to you know, adults who would rather you didn't know things or find things out. But that ferocity is at odds with, I think, a lot of people's perceptions of Christianity. You know, and, and it may be that Nietzschean suspicion that Christianity is all about um, that kind of... Uh, a weak morality, a slave morality, mm -hmm. that he calls it, and sort of putting up with things rather than changing things and mm. being brave. I think this is so true when you say that the sort of image of Christianity that we have often, particularly in this country, been left with is one of um, something that goes against the sort of bold, ironizing spirit of the British, as if it's a little bit embarrassing. And Francis Bufford, in his book, um, unapologetic white like Christianity makes surprising emotional sense. Um, you know, he writes about this, the idea that often our cultural images of Christianity that we have currently are of something a little bit prim, a little bit disapproving, a little bit, oh no, please, after you. Mm. I think about this a lot in the way that we talk about self-sacrifice, because often in the children's books that we have loved, not just mine, but so many children's mm. books, there is a child who, is in, who learns about sacrifice. And I think often in Christianity, that has been used in very complicated ways. Self-sacrifice, of course, is the thing that the image of Christ offers in its most powerful form and tells us this truth that we know to be true which is that those moments in which you exist, whether Christian or not, in, the, in generosity and in a pouring out of one's care and turning away from many of the cons that the world would offer you of, of money mm. and applause, are when you feel richest and most whole. But that is a discovery that had been turned into an edict and used to oppress people. Yeah. And I think that becomes very complicated. And the whole idea mm. of self-sacrifice for Christian women is very complicated. Mm. Self-sacrifice, which is demanded of them yeah. um, and used to oppress and to belittle. Um, so the whole idea of sacrifice, I think, is such a difficult one to, mm. to really pinpoint. But I have a book coming out soon in which, at the very end, one of the children sacrifices themselves much too complicated to explain the plot. <laughs> she's not really a child, she's an immortal soul. But, um, but the idea would be that what if this was where the truest joy mm. and the boldest imagination lay? But the moment you change that from a truth into an order, mm. you enter the space where something very beautiful can be used in profoundly ugly ways. I, I think that recognition of the danger of of sacrificial action or substitutionary action, the coerced sacrifice, mm. is there even in the New Testament. So one of the great and quite deliberate ironies in, in the Gospels is that Caiaphas, the high priest, says uh, of Jesus that it, it's expedient that one man should die for the people. And it's true, theologically, um, and this will be a death for the sake of others. That's at the heart of Christian faith. So Caiaphas is, as it were, speaking the truth without knowing what he's saying, and, and he, he means it differently. So he will seek to extort this death to solve a problem, a religious and political problem. Um, with Jesus out of the way, things, things will be easier. Uh, but Jesus will die freely for, for a different and greater purpose than that. And I think that, therefore, becomes one of the key questions when, when one's thinking about self-sacrifice is, the extent to which it's coerced or genuinely freely embraced. And of course, we can deceive ourselves about when, when we think we want to make self-sacrifices. But more generally, I, I think that the, the idea of, of, as it were, suffering for another or doing anything for another becomes more and more difficult in our culture. Um, and it's partly because the way we tend to talk about ourselves is as separate centres of agency, each of whom is they're the master or mistress of their own vessel. 
rather than able to take over anyone else's, for, even for a while. Yeah. And actually, some of the most moving moments of self-sacrificial activity in your books, or even surrogacy, this idea of mm -hmm. taking the place of another, are the adults, you know, that, that Charles at the end of Rooftoppers, he, he were left thinking he's had to give up Sophie, who he's loved, um, when she d discovers her mother again in Paris. Mm -hmm. There's something extraordinarily poignant about the way he, he watches mm. from a slight distance yeah. and, and, you know. Uh, and there are actually lots of cases in the books where parents are not there for whatever reason and others have to fill the gap. Sometimes it's other children and sometimes it's other adults. I think children's fiction has such a fabulous history of this form of mm. surrogacy, of offering both children and adults the idea that the world might be such or could be such, that if your child is left standing alone, other adults will stand up to the plate and swing for them. Mm. And I think if you think of something like the railway children, mm. yeah. where the father disappears and the mother is absent because she is working so hard to keep them alive, that is a chapter by chapter exploration of the ways in which adults come forth for them and mm. offer them jokes and care and mm. warmth. E. Nesbitt's vision was, of course, a, a sort of Fabian society, socialist mm. uh, vision of the world. But she had this idea that, what if we gave children the idea that this might be true? Mm. What then? I mean, the other reason, of course, is, I'm sure you know this, you sort of, the minute you have two very caring, very loving parents in a children's book, you have limited capacities for plot to happen. Yes. Because the children will not be forced to the brink of their own capabilities yes. because the parent will always be there to say, don't worry, I'll deal with it, darling. Yes. Which is why there are so many orphans in children's fiction and why, you know, yeah. the most endangered creature in the world is a mother in a children's book, you know, just yes. car crashes everywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, and so there, it is partly a, a plot device, mm. but it is also partly, I think, a vision of the world that so many children's writers have wanted to offer. Mm. The idea that if you stand orphaned, the world is such that though there will be danger, and though there will be those who will not seek to help, there mm. will also be people, often in children's books, people who are eccentric, often mm. people who are somewhat outside the circles of recognisable power, mm. who will step in and gather you up. Mm. And I find that such a powerful ideal. Again, that might not be true. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's not true. Mm. I don't know. But I love the idea that we lay it out in children's fiction. Yes. I mean, again, it's a theological word to try to inject into what you put so beautifully in, in your own words. But those, those are like moments of grace. Yes. Um, and and you, you talk in Wolf Wilder about, you acknowledge moments where the world seems suddenly kind. Mm. Um, and you recognise you can't guarantee that. And it won't always happen. But there, but there are moments when it does. And... Um, and being open to them and prepared mm. to receive them when they happen without assuming that the world is always going to be safe and that you won't ever die, I think is part of what you communicate. Um, I think about this so much, the idea that often with children's fiction especially, people are trying to crystallise this is true, both a hope and a truth. Mm. I think The Railway Children is very, very true of this. And mm. I love this book so much. Sometimes when I talk about it, I cry, so brace yourself. Well, yeah. <laughs> that book understands so much about human pain. Mm. And throughout the book, the children do suffer. Mm. Huge injustice, because of course, Bobby finds out that her father has been uh, arrested unfairly and potentially forever. And she has been crashed into the real life reality of legal injustice mm. and inequalities. They're not a rich family. He has, they have no way of getting out the father from prison. And Inesbit doesn't shy away from the idea that that might be forever. Mm. And then of course the old gentleman helps them. Mm. And there is this one of the most beautiful scenes in literature. Mm. This is the crying bit mm. <laughs> where there is the train arrives and there's the smoke mm. and she doesn't see him 
in this book is she cries, oh, daddy, my daddy. Mm. And it's in part so valuable because, of course, it's this moment where before she was exiled from childhood. Mm. And then suddenly she is allowed back into it. But it is also this bold and beautiful idea. The world will largely break faith with you. The world will largely not offer its most bright and shining face because it is broken. But sometimes the smoke will clear and the thing you long for most will call your name. Mm. This idea that Ines but had, I'm sorry, this is very pathetic. Know. Sometimes the world does turn good. Mm. And sometimes wealth is dropped into your lap and you are embraced by pure love. Mm. Lovely, gosh. <laughs> okay, recovery moment. I just I'm sorry I so to cry love about that. I children. so love that book too. I don't know if Inez but was Christian. I have a feeling that she had a very complicated relationship with I Christianity. I can't discern it because I, yeah, I can't tell. But she had, she had clearly a deep understanding of many of the things that Christianity at its very finest would offer. Yes, and I agree. And, and actually another another quite a different sort of um, effect that she explores or, or set of ideas she explores is that of desire and how easy it is for desires to be misplaced. So the, the, the wishes in Five Children and It and the way they all go wrong is, is one of the most, for me as a theologian, one of the most theologically satisfying explorations of misplaced desire mm. and, and the business of purifying desire through one's mistakes, so that eventually something really good does emerge, but that sense of learning. I think Five Children and It might be one of the most perfect books yeah. about, as you say, desire and how to educate your yearning heart mm. with actual facts about the reality of the world. Mm. You know, they wish for wings mm. and, and then they get stranded on top of a rooftop. And then of course they wish to be beautiful as the day and the mm. mother doesn't recognize them. Yeah. Um, I find that book because it isn't sanctimonious and it isn't didactic. It's just mm. deeply, warmly human mm. and so funny. That mm. used to be one of my favourite books. Yeah. Still is. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that comes out to me from your books is how strongly you want to um, sort of desanitize the world or at least sort of question whether there are attempts to make the world. Mm. Hygienic, and I mean both literally and morally hygienic, are a problem. And, and so these extreme situations that the children are often in are ones where you have to live with dirt. A bit like the Bible, there are a lot of bodily fluids in your book, a lot of blood. Mm -hmm. You refer to blood a, a great deal, and also urine and snot. And, and it sort of gets the world back into its proper dirtiness mm. somehow. Yeah. There's also something a bit 17th century about that. Yes, that, you know, yes, I'm a sure. Pre, a pre-hygienic. Yeah. Is that something you consciously think about? And I, 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 part of the reason I ask is that a few, quite a few years ago, I edited a book called Heresies and How to Avoid Them. And they were all about traditional doctrinal heresies. And I always kind of wanted to write another follow-up book called Modern Heresies and How to Avoid Them. And one of the modern heresies I wanted, if I had written it, I would have wanted to address it is sanitization, yeah. sort of excessive sanitization, making everyone safe and clean and then meaning they never really live. Yeah. So this is utterly an abiding philosophy. Dirt is my abiding philosophy in children's fiction, I think. In part, for very practical, realistic terms, the dirt is of course both a metaphor mm. and also practical mm. because the constant beating back of entropy, mm. of dust and mud, the emphasis on pure cleanliness just eats your day, mm. just in terms of your focus and your time. So a little bit of grubbiness seems to me absolutely imperative for a free childhood, because a clean child is a restrained child. And so that's why the books are so full of, as you say, dirt, blood, snot. Um, and then also the idea of allowing children to be a little bit physically free mm. and a little bit physically reckless. Mm. And the ways that that 
is so difficult for adults. I think if the social consensus has become that risk-taking in children is in some ways a moral uh, failing on the part of their adults to maintain proper surveillance of them, that children must be removed from risk. I think we must fight back against that in order to have children who have had the full experience of their capacities and their braveries and their, um, you know, inadequacies. Like, mm. I was a clumsy child and I discovered that, mm. <laughs> um, you know, at my own risk. And um, Scars, you are. Scars, covered, I'm got covered the scars in to prove scars, it. yes. And, and, I, and I, don't, I don't love the idea of a world in which we should be unscarred by our past, mm. both physically and emotionally. I, I like the idea that there should be space for physical mistakes, physical dirt, and the kind of emotional equivalent of that as well. Mm. So that is why, as well, a lot of the books are children doing things that are just at the edge of what a child could do physically. Yes, there's almost a sense of these children at the limits of their capacities, in, in, in lots of the books, sort of having to do something like a, a wilderness wandering, that sort of exodus mm -hmm. and, and that journey through the, the desert. Um, although, you know, it's every kind of um, physical environment you can imagine from the snowy wastes of Russia to the Amazon. But in each case, there's a sense of a, of a wilderness journey. And as in the great sort of biblical exodus narrative, it's never undertaken alone. Um, have you d sort of deliberately tried to, to play with that literary and scriptural motif of the journey? I think, I think it must be partly that growing up both with Christianity and with great epic, mm. it, is, it is drilled into the marrow of my bones, the idea that a great journey might be a place where you begin one way and something that was always in you through that hardship and that newness and that shock of the new rises to the top and you are able to hold it and see it mm. and that you then carry it on with you when the journey is done. One thing that um, just maybe just goes back to self-sacrifice and coercion mm. and so on. One of the great scenes that I know from our conversation just before we started filming that matters, that means a lot to you from, um, from the biblical stories is the Annunciation to Mary, so the angel's arrival, to not simply tell Mary she's going to have a child who's the son of God, but actually ask for her consent. Mm. And it's a moment which could be coercive and sometimes has been read as coercive, but also is the central moment in which a human being says yes to something miraculously divine. You know, in the Christian story, nothing would be possible without her yes. And it isn't theologically understood in, as in any way coerced, it's, a, it's hers. Why does that story interest you so much? And I know it interests you also in its depictions in visual mm, art. It does. So wherever I go to a new city, I go to find their annunciations. Mm. I must have seen a hundred or more. I have never not seen one that I have not seen some delight in. I think it is for several reasons. If you think of the story, it is this moment of both total transformation of her life mm. and of the world itself. And also, if you look at the paintings, it is also recognition, this moment of profound recognition and the idea that recognition and transformation might be deeply, deeply bound up in us. That sometimes one is almost inseparable from the other. And then if you go looking for the paintings, sometimes she looks so afraid and sometimes she has a look of inwardness mm. and sometimes of awe. And in the very finest, all of those things, I think the Fra Angelico Annunciation in San Marco in Florence is, is my vote for maybe the loveliest thing ever made by man. I find it so beautiful. Mm. I find it this turning point captured in a moment and it has such love. And as you say, it could be read as an order, as a coercion, mm. but she says yes. 
And those paintings often seem to me paintings of the very concept of yes, like yes, I say yes, I say yes. And I also just love the advantage that people have taken of that moment to paint angels' wings. Mm. The colors of angels' wings that you will see if you go and find a hundred enunciations. The visions of what people have decided beauty might look like and, and lightning bolts might look like. Sometimes a wall is crumbling in as an angel bursts through it. Mm. Sometimes there is just a small partridge on the floor. Mm. I don't know, what's your favorite organization? Do you have is a... opening, yes. The, the, um, oh, just, I, well, I was saying to you before, the, the Filippo Lippi Annunciation in the National Gallery in London, if I had to choose a local one, that has to be it. And um, it's actually not an altarpiece, like mostly, or well, very frequently they are. It's, an, it's painted to be above a door, probably in a Medici palace. Um, but one of the things I love about that is that it's a threshold and the sort of axis created between Gabriel and Mary uh, to left and to right um, creates at the same time a sense of a pathway for us through the middle and there's a staircase directly ahead of us behind both of them which starts to go up and then turns to the right and disappears so you've got this sense of not quite knowing where you might be taken but you are being drawn into the, the force field created by their encounter and then beyond it to an ascent to a place you don't yet see, you can't yet see. So all of that's going on. And also her, this has been commented on by others, so I, I'm just borrowing it, but unlike a lot of annunciations, the dove descends towards her belly and not her ear, or uh, as is often the case, because she hears the words of Gabriel, but to her belly. So it's very sort of, in a sense, you know, gynecologically correct, mm -hmm. that's the womb. But there's a gap in her tunic which, um, which opens a bit like the pupil of an eye. Mm -hmm. And the word tunica, I believe, in Latin was used to describe the aperture in the eye. Um, so this opening in her tunic is, 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 is as though her, her womb becomes ocular and the light is entering and it's a conception like the conceptions we form in our imaginations or minds through the eye, but her whole body has become an eye and the conception isn't just mental, it's a conception in all of her. So that's why I love that. Um, so beautiful. So it needs to be looked at again, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, and I, again and again. So I have seen that painting, but I did not see the gap in the tunic. Have a look next and time. And that does seem to me one of the, one of the things about those paintings is that they are so often layered mm. with, with so many gestures towards so many different possibilities of the Christian experience. There are so many, if, if you, especially if you, if you see a lot of them, the ways that people have chosen to lay down what they think will be important about what is to come is just, mm. it is a remarkable thing. Yes, yeah. yeah. One of the qualities of many Annunciation paintings is that intense focus of the angel and the young woman on each other. Um, and that sense of, you know, attending to each other and through their encounter, attending to the, the will of God, which is both very concrete at this moment, but also mysterious. But that, that quality of attention is something that you, again, make, I think, a, a very central theme in your books and it's partly no, just noticing things and partly attending to things, especially things that might kill you, is just a matter of survival. But it isn't only about survival, it's about that richness of life that, that you've talked about. Um, uh, and it's also a very important part of relating to the, to the visual arts as well as to literature. And, and it has deep roots as a kind of religious virtue, the contemplative life. You're kind of active and you commend the active life. You've talked about that, this risk taking and adventure, but actually you're commending the contemplative life too, aren't you? And so much of what you've written. I think so. I think, I think attention might be so closely bound up with love as to be almost indistinguishable. 
and I think it might be the thing we owe the world most. Attention to the natural world, attention to the intricate reality of one another's hearts, attention, of course, to, to the political reality of the world that we stand upon, unswervingly, unflinchingly, to the injustices that we live among. I think it is one of the hardest things to sustain, and I think it is one of the finest gifts that we can offer. And that's the thing that I want to tell children. You know, the world is immense, and it awaits you, and it is worth your passionate and focused attention. Go forth and offer it.